WhenTheAdultsChange.com. So just by way of introduction, um, uh, Paul has asked me to speak a bit about my own experiences of um, experiencing trauma uh, whilst I was at school. Um, I am going to talk quite heavily about what I've experienced, but um, this has been the basis of my PhD um, and it has been researched extensively. So what I talk about is also research and evidence, um, although largely driven by my own experiences. So um, I was 15 when I was in a coach crash. Um, I was on holiday. Um, I wasn't with school friends. I was with the air cadets. Um, we were hit by two 38 ton lorries. Quite a few people died. It was front page news. Um, and I returned to school uh, about 10 days later um and that has had a reasonably catastrophic impact on um certainly the 20 years that followed um it resulted in me being sectioned um i was diagnosed with a variety of mental health conditions i was heavily medicated um and that wasn't something i wanted to live with and to, I guess, understand if this was something everybody that had experienced a, a complex and acute trauma, if they followed the same path uh, to find a way to fix my brain. Um, and I guess to be an advocate for younger, you know, who I was when I was younger, I went off and did some research um, and, did, and, and completed my PhD because of that. So I found that when death, media coverage, shock and tragedy coexist, people have a very specific response. So we're talking about road accidents, uh, natural disasters, um, murder, you know, things that I guess people think will never happen to them. The, the number of schools that reach out to us because of those circumstances is far higher than we might like to imagine it would be. And during lockdown, I did some additional research to see how many people, it wasn't children specific, but how many people would have experienced the pandemic as an acute trauma. And it's about 12%. Um, so, so this is much more prevalent than we might think it is. And, I, I, you know, I haven't got a huge amount of time to go into what acute trauma is, how that pans out. I want to give you some things to do. Um, and those things could be applied, hopefully, to anybody that has experienced trauma. Um, if you want to know more or if there's something you're experiencing or in the future, if something happens, contact us and I will help. Um, one of the frightening things, I guess, is that, and, and, and I've interviewed people that were in the Potter's Bar train crash. I worked on the response to the Manchester Arena attacks. Um, I've spoken to hundreds of people that have, have been impacted by fatal road accidents. I've supported a school where a pupil had murdered another pupil. The, the overwhelming result for people that experience acute trauma is that not a lot happens in the short term. So three years is the typical time where you will start to see grassroots of that distress behaviour. That doesn't mean that nothing is happening and your behaviour doesn't matter. And how adults, caregivers, you know, people around individuals that have experienced acute trauma behave in those first three years has a really big impact on where those individuals will be in 20 years time. It's just the distressed behaviour isn't obvious. Um, so that's why we're going to talk about it. And that's why it's so important. So first, I'm going to give you five points um, that hopefully will be useful regardless. But the first thing, and I, I, I think this is a 
bigger issue, but we 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 must validate emotions when they're being shared with us. So my experience of this, uh, I felt very guilty about the coach crash and I felt very guilty that people had died. And when I was brave enough to tell people that, and that wasn't brave like turning your camera on and talking in a breakout room. I mean, it, it, huge, huge working up to finding someone safe and getting the words out and having self-realisation. There were a couple of times that I found myself in a position where I needed, I suspect, to do that. And the response I have always received is, you shouldn't feel guilty. And and that's, I know people are doing that because they're trying to be nice. Um, it doesn't help. You know, I still feel the, the guilt hasn't changed. And today I wouldn't get diagnosed with a mental health condition. I don't take any medication. Um, there aren't any sort of any of that distress behavior isn't around today but the guilt still exists you know no one ever said okay I can see how or why you might feel guilty but let's look at how we make sure that doesn't impact your decision about what you do in your A-levels or how you enter a relationship or how you try and maintain friendships People always focused on trying to shift the guilt as if if they could brush that feeling away, things would be better for me. And actually, that's just piling on shame. And the bravery that it took to speak in the first place is is rejected. And it just goes further and further down. And the the distressed behaviour when it eventually does come out is far more complex. It's like carrying a bag round that's got mouldy fruit in, right? If you if people aren't letting you get things out properly, you've got to carry that round for 20 years. And at 20 years, the mouldy fruit bag is a right mess. So um, you don't have to agree with how people feel. And it doesn't have to be right in the moment and it might change what somebody says to you on day one might not be what they say in day seven but it's not our position to question the validity of people's emotions so that's point one point two um, and this is quite specific to something that's been in the media but is more common because of social media if something has happened to you and other people are shaping that narrative by talking about it on Instagram or posting about it on TikTok, if it is something that is shocking, in 5, 10, 20 years time, you are not going to remember your version of reality. What you will remember is a concoction of what other people have said and you know, hopefully it's not a huge spoiler alert, but people aren't always very nice on uh, social media and the press aren't always that nice either. Um, that one of the one of the most significant things um, I found in my PhD is that over 80 percent of people that had experienced acute trauma went on to think that the person or people that had died, whether they knew them or not, um, they had experiences of, of feeling like they were haunting them um, and had like visual hallucinations, I guess, of, of pictures that were shown in the media playing on that guilt mechanism. Um, so people get into quite, that's quite a complex set of behaviours and, and, and creates all sorts of red flags for within the, you know, within the mental health system. It's because your brain doesn't, it will start grappling to find what happened and create a narrative that you can file away as part of the processing of the trauma. If you're relying on a mixture of things that you know aren't necessarily true, um, I, I, one of my friends, for example, lost her brother. Um, he he drowned in a swimming pool and she had flashbacks she she wasn't there she didn't see anything but she had flashbacks from the newspaper picture of of 
him laying on the pool and when you're having that sort of image and you know you weren't there like that is one sure way to make you feel like you're going absolutely mad and the feeling when that's associated with death is that it's a punishment like it's really easy to find yourself in quite a complex situation um so at the beginning <laughs> you need to create your own narrative and adults will need to help young people or, or any people actually do that you have to write your own account and save it somewhere so that when your brain starts looking for the story to file away what you have is your own facts your own version and not this mash of media and other people's stuff and you can evaluate those horrible bits for what they are um yeah so thinking about a scrapbook a diary a letter anything just get something down and file it away for a rainy day and also i guess just a note on that when people are in that state explaining what's happening is virtually impossible because you get in a cycle of fear and shame the shame is strong like if you think you're being haunted by somebody that has died and it's your fault when somebody says hey are you okay like you're not gonna say Sh sure um not really because i think i'm being haunted like you just say yeah yeah fine so um, I'll cover it again in a, in a moment, but giving people stories, letting them know that their brain might do that, that education around this is what's happened and this is how your brain might respond is really helpful because it takes away the, the feeling that you're being controlled by someone else and makes you think, oh, my brain's just being a bit rubbish because I've been involved in this awful step thing. Point three, um, when I returned to school, um, I was the only person in my school that was in the coach crash and I, I, I walked back into the playground. Um, I've done lots of walks of shame, but that was definitely the most significant. Like everybody was silent. I knew that everybody knew what had happened. Um, it was a bit like being in a goldfish bowl and that feeling stayed for a long time and I know everyone wanted to help I know people felt sorry for me people wanted to be kind and do the right thing but actually people also went oh she's been involved in something hideous and I don't really know what to say and I don't want to be the person that makes her cry so I'll just keep you know, two steps back. Don't let children do that. Like, help them, ask them what they want, walk with them, uh, you know, tell, make a group, get a group of people and help them think about how they might react. Like one person that would stand next to them and walk with them would make a huge difference. Um, and I think that goes on everything from where they sit in the classroom, what they're going to do at playtime, um, just just touch points so that there isn't that we're going to just let you do with this, deal with this on your own because it's a bit above our pay grade. We're not sure what to do with this, so we'll just sort of leave you to it and hope we don't poke the wasp's nest, as it were. Um, next point. Uh, out versus in, in any capacity, is hugely beneficial. Um, when people ask me how I got how I got better, I think people think that there's some big epiphany. I got better with a pen and paper, quite a lot of it. And I wrote and I wrote and I did drawings and I did random like brain dumps and drawings of clouds and all sorts of stuff. And actually, you just sort of exhaust getting stuff out. And things that I thought in my head 
when I wrote them on paper, I was like, oh, that seems a bit silly. Perhaps maybe it wasn't quite like that. Maybe this isn't quite what I need to think. But also just get stuff out. Things in your head. And this is true of any sort of distress behaviour and ability to regulate that processing and just get working things through helps that's why that's why we that's why Paul started this off by talking about time sometimes you just need time if something really big has happened that's a lot of time it's a lot of processing so we did you know as a group we did some scrapbooking and some writing and we wrote letters to our friends that passed away and whatever and then people thought they you know we'd done that like no 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 this isn't a one letter gig i mean i i have written hundreds of letters hundreds i've written letters to the coach driver i've written letters to the lorry drivers i've written letters to the parents of the people that died i've never sent them but but it you have to get it out and that takes ages. And and just because you've written the letter once, you might in six months time feel completely different and want to get something totally different out. Just being told that you can do that and that that might be a good thing to do is really helpful. And when you know that your thoughts don't make sense and that you ne don't necessarily want to share them and see other people's reactions, that personal writing it doesn't have to be writing it could be it could be whatever but getting it out it, it, in a way that you don't have to deal with other people's reactions is massively important and then I'm conscious Paul always likes to finish on time so I'm going to whiz through <laughs> um, <laughs> the the last piece possibly the most important is that you you have to give people hope. Like when something, when acute trauma happens, people will think their life is over anyway. When, when the adults behave as if they are written off and their life is over and that they're not gonna get their GCSEs, do their A-levels, go to university, have a job because that oh that awful thing has happened and that's probably it for them like that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy so people have to have hope that trauma can be processed and if you have to make up stories if you have to google you know the x factor watch the x factor and listen to the sub stories right borrow some of them like children have to hear that things can get better and if you don't have a story to use you can use mine um I'm, I'm happy you know if, if any of this is useful or if people want to know more like you can contact me and I, and I will help um I hope it's been useful <laughs>